Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union. Today we'll be having an exciting conversation about some of the most important issues taking place around the world. And we're gonna be looking at the, the title of today is The Whole World is Watching, Human Rights in the United States. I'm fortunate enough to be joined today by two amazing advocates, Greg Jackson, the National Advocacy Director for Community Justice Action Fund and a gun violence survivor in Washington, DC, and Derek Ingram, co-founder of Warriors in the Garden. Both of them are speaking with us today because it's an important event happening at the UN. Today, we will be on the eve of the High Commissioner presenting her first oral update to the UN Human Rights Council on the preparation of the report on systematic racism and police brutality especially those incidents that result in the death of George Floyd and of other African-American and people of African descent, as well as government response to anti-racism, peaceful protests. The High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva, Switzerland will share her initial findings and that will take place tomorrow. So we're excited to be able to meet today to discuss the state of systemic racism and police brutality, and more importantly, what we can do about that. I'll want to thank Greg and introduce him and ask him to please share his story a bit and why it's important that we focus on this important issue. All right, well, thanks for having me, Josh. Um, so I'm Greg Jackson, the uh, National Advocacy Director for the Community Justice Action Fund. Um, our entire mission is to end gun violence in black and brown communities by uplifting community-based solutions and really centering the people who are most impacted by violence. Um, the I come to this work, frankly, um, because I'm a survivor of gun violence. And I was shot in 2013. Um, and even seven years ago, there's still some really big memories that stand out to me. Um, one, you know, when I was shot, uh, my nurse shared with me that every day there are young black men like me that come through those doors. Um, in America, over 100,000 people are shot or killed by guns every year. And over 70% of homicide victims are black or brown. Um, the other big thing that stood out to me was as a survivor of gun violence, there were so many challenges and trials that I faced, whether that was mentally, financially, housing, uh, economically, et cetera. Um, but the services provided to me were purely uh, medical. Um, and over 66% of people who are shot in America um, survive, but the resources they receive are typically only medical. Um, so we also know when we think about this cycle of gun violence that's happening, in order to reduce violence and reduce the pain and trauma, there needs to be more resources invested in those people that are impacted. The last big thing though, that really stood out to me was that gun violence, uh, even as old as 2013 was seen as a political football and something that was passed back and forth as a hot topic or an issue. But in the African-American community in the black community in our brown communities, our Latinx communities, it's not an issue, it's, it's a reality for us. Um, unfortunately, I was nearly shot four other times um, growing up here in America. Um, and I knew that this was a crisis that was a big deal, but I didn't understand that it was only as big of a deal to us, um, unlike our, our white comrades in, in the country. The other big thing I wanted to share is that, you know, when I entered the hospital, I was met by three investigators before I could meet my doctor. Um, and when we look at gun violence in America, the approach to addressing gun violence and just violence in general is not to proactively prevent it, but it's to pour in more policing, more crime control, more law enforcement, higher prison sentencing, and really the incarceral approach um, to addressing gun violence. But we've seen that move before. We saw that with the war on drugs. We've watched this for decades where policing and higher sentencing and law enforcement is not the way to end a crisis like gun violence. The way that we do it is by investing in proactive solutions and proactive community-based solutions on programs that focus on those who are most at risk to permitting a violent crime and helping them get out of that situation and away from the desperation that creates that conflict. Programs that help support people who are most mentally impacted or socially impacted um, by gun violence in their community. But most importantly, making sure that neighborhoods and communities have the resources and the opportunity to live a quality life, um, a healthy life, and a life full of opportunity and not desperation um, like we've seen before. Um, last thing I'll just share, you know, a lot of what we're seeing um, during COVID-19, we're seeing big spikes in gun violence across the country. And it's not because of more police. It's not because of uh, harsher sentencing. Um, the reason we're seeing spikes is because people are really hurting. Um, they're, they're hurting when it comes to housing, when it comes to finances, when it comes to lack of education, lack of access to safe spaces. And so the way that we can reduce 
um, violence in our country is not more policing, it's not more law enforcement, but it's investing in these communities um, to uplift them. And so I, I would love to talk a little bit more about the challenge with policing and law enforcement. I think we've seen um, some of the crazy and uh, dark shortfalls of a um, focused approach to supporting communities that are dealing with violent crime. Um, but I'm sure we'll come back to that um, after my fellow panelists. Absolutely. And I think what you're talking about there is also the human rights based approach. It's a proactive participatory, but also trying to prevent that if we actually focus on prevention instead of punitive measures in this uh, police state, we'd actually have a much safer society for everyone and can eliminate a great deal of the violence as well. So I really think we'll get into that and discuss. And if there's one thing you'd like to add to that, I'll definitely let you continue. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the major thing that I'll, I'll share is that we've seen the outcome of decades and decades of policing um, communities that are hurting the most. And that results in one, the ineffective ability, the inability to reduce violent crime, especially gun violence and homicide. Um, but most importantly, we've seen how the instances of police violence, um, police brutality can not only harm people, traumatize communities, but also take lives and destroy the trust um, between a community and government. And so, uh, you know, this summer and this year has been a big eye opener for so many people across the country about how police violence and brutality is playing out in our neighborhoods every day. Um, and I think it rein reinforces the need to do more than police these neighborhoods. I mean, my neighborhood, you know, in every block you can find a cop car, but the high school four blocks down the street is literally falling apart. You know, we have a 41% dropout rate. There's the one grocery store we get to never has fresh produce. Um, you know, we don't have a rec center that's walkable. Um, our school systems are struggling. The actual economic opportunities are non-existent but yet we have police, police officers with cars, bicycles, even horses sometimes parading through our neighborhoods of folks who are struggling with poverty, struggling with desperation, um, and struggling with interpersonal conflict that a lot of it is a byproduct of the neglect of these neighborhoods. Um, I really wanna push back on the concept that violence is happening by criminals or gangs or no it's not these are a lot of these incidents are interpersonal conflicts that escalate out of frustration out of stress out of uh you know inability to to resolve conflicts um and then most importantly pain you know people that are in pain um in conflict is one of the worst things you can do um and our government can change that um, by simple things like investing in our communities investing in our schools investing in programs investing in our mental health investing in our access to health care. Um, there's so little that's being done that there's, there's nothing too small that can be done to invest in these communities to make a big difference. And we've seen certain cities like Stockton, California. Um, we've seen just different areas across the country who have started to invest and have seen drastic reductions in violent crime. And it's not because the, the, the actual neighborhood uh, members have changed. It's not because the community has changed. It's because the investment is actually focused on uplifting every person in that state or in that city. Um, and that's what we wanna see all over the country. And you highlighted so well in this country, we focus a lot on civil and political rights, but also that economic, social and cultural rights, the right to housing, the right to healthcare, the right to education, those are absolutely essential. And if we focus on those, we could see changes that are positive in people's daily living. And I think that's one of the other aspects is also this pandemic COVID because we had been with each other in Washington, D.C., meeting with uh, embassies, preparing for this universal periodic review in February. And really, this pandemic just exposed all of the cracks in the society and all the challenges that were being ignored. And gun violence is definitely one pandemic, and so is racism. And that's really what we're getting into next. And at the Human Rights Council, they organized an urgent debate and reorganized 144 families of victims of police violence and over 360 civil society organizations from around the world. They sent a letter to the High Commissioner for Human Rights saying that there must be an examination of human rights in the United States and it must look at systemic racism and police brutality. And because of that advocacy, the nations of Africa put this on the UN Human Rights Council agenda and there was an urgent debate this summer. And of course it was focusing on George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Philando Castle, and Michael Brown. 
and it was an important first time ever that the whole world is watching and the U.S. would receive such scrutiny. Normally, the U.S. loves to talk about being so exceptional, but this was an example that the world said we must be really focused on the human rights situation. Our next speaker, Derek Ingram, has an amazing amount of experience as an advocate from Ferguson all the way, unfortunately, to most recently organizing in Hell's Kitchen in New York. And I'd like him to share a brief bit about some of the reasons he got involved and in, in what he's still doing today and why we have to continue organizing. Yeah, first I wanted to respond to like um, something that Greg said. Um, just, I believe it's a, a mentality that we believe in and that we push a lot in terms of investing in communities. Um, but a lot of those systems, even once we invest in them, they're inherently racist. Um, our education system, our housing system, our political system, um, in a lot of economic uh, sectors, even if we funnel all of this money into them, they're Eurocentric, they're still gonna be discriminatory against black people and we still won't get equity. So I think it should be focused more um, on reinvesting, but also reimagining these systems completely. Um, people ask if, Warriors in the Garden, the, the organization that I helped co-found um, is reformist or abolitionist. And I don't like to use either one of those words. I believe that, you know, it's, it's way more nuanced than that. But I also believe that funneling money into systems that are already broken, that are already inherently biased and racist against black people, um, doesn't necessarily activate the equity and the equality that we want in those systems. Um, but yeah, I agree with everything I'll say you said. Um, so, uh, <laughs> my name's Derek. Um, I co-founded Warriors in the Garden. Um, it's a collective of progressive activists. We're all 20 to 29 years old. Um, and we came together on the front lines in New York City on May 29th, the first day of the George Floyd protest. Um, and we all came together and connected over this visceral pain and trauma of just becoming used to seeing black bodies vilified and killed um, by police on social media, um, as well as the, as the news. Um, I started my political journey personally um, in Ferguson uh, while I was in college completing my MBA in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and I became very active in the Black Lives Matter movement. I got to meet a lot of important and influential people um, like Cori Bush, who just was nominated for, she's the first black woman in Missouri to be nominated for a congressional district, um, which is super exciting. But um, I left there and since leaving St. Louis, I moved to New York and I've immediately become active in this community here. Um, and Warriors in the Garden has led countless nonviolent protests, um, like I said, after George Floyd's death. I mean, we've been featured um, on every major news outlet um, and we've activated our community, done a lot of community events, engagement um, and things of that nature. Um, and we were on the grounds for three months straight, holding rallies, sit-ins, demonstrations, um, engaging our community for food drives to, to, to everything. And um, what happened to me uh, after that was on August 7th. Um, I had been surveilled by the police for a little bit before that, but um, it came to a forefront on August 7th at 7, 7 a.m. Um, I was awoken to police banging on my door. Um, I immediately called uh, other people in my group and informed them that uh, the police were banging. They told me that they had a warrant um, and they told me to go on Instagram Live. So I did. I returned to the door and asked the officers uh, to slide the warrant under the door and they informed me that they did not have a warrant. Um, for the next five hours, dozens of officers harassed, berated, and terrorized me by taking over my street, neighboring buildings, and demanding without cause or, or warrant that I surrender to them. They were on rooftops, they brought drones, dogs, fire trucks, emergency vehicles. Um, there were sharpshooters in the building across from me. They set up barriers and shut down traffic. I was filming the incident, incident the whole time. People came out, um, including my neighbors and other people in my group and other activists to stand in solidarity. Um, and they began chanting um, 
and marching up and down my street and, and stood in solidarity with me, but the police were unrelenting. Um, I was on the phone with my attorney trying to get everything figured out um, to arrange a peaceful surrender. Um, and to say I was terrified is a complete understatement. Um, that incident reminded me of one uh, of my friend, Thaddeus McCarroll, who was also an activist um, in the Ferguson movement, who was having a mental health issue, answered his door. The police tried to enter without a warrant and um, he ended up being shot and he passed away in 2015. Um, and, and that that moment and, and, and his spirit were definitely with me uh, during this incident. But um, thanks to the support of my neighbors, my community, um, my organization, Warriors in the Garden, uh, my attorney, the news media, um, and as well as Amnesty International, the NYPD eventually backed off. I was able to surrender the next day. I marched to the precinct early in the morning. Um, and everybody was outraged by what had happened to me, especially when they found out um, what I was being accused of, which was um, allegedly screaming loudly into an officer's ear with a megaphone. Um, so for me, it was obvious that this was an act of intimidation. It was inherently political and our police department and law enforcement are supposed to be apolitical. Um, and it was to instill fear in me and in other activists. And sadly, I'm not the only activist that has been targeted by the NYPD. Um, they have a decades long history of doing this, um, of harassing and disappearing activists without due process. Um, police departments across this nation have paid millions of dollars in lawsuit settlements, and yet people like me, Black people who are fighting for racial justice continue to be targeted, arrested, and persecuted for demanding the right not to be killed by the police because of the color of our skin. Um, so that just reminds me how Black people have to navigate society differently. Um, how Black boys and girls grow up uh, with this inherent fear, um, maybe having gun violence within their neighborhood, but also having police intimidation and police brutality into their neighborhood. Um, at Warriors in the Garden, we have a vision statement um, that talks about uh, us wanting a prosperous nation where empathy and justice is paramount. A progressive society where all lives are valued and each citizen given the opportunity to succeed without having to navigate any form of systemic oppression a nonviolent republic free of police brutality and all other forms of violence against people of color. A world where young black boys and girls can live freely and fully without apprehension or fear. A nation where there's truly liberty and justice for all. And to me, until we have that, um, until the next generation of black boys and black girls don't have to fear walking down the street or interactions with police, we, we have to, to fight for, for justice and we have to fight for, for that equity and equality. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a continued fight. And it, I think we need to focus on strategic dismantling as well. That's perfect. And I think that gets to the point of human rights is it's really a, a minimum that no one should have those rights violated and anyone's life should not be go below a certain level of dignity. But it's also, as you said, it's also a horizon. It's what we're aiming for and what we want in this world and how things can be so much better. And I think that's really the point of what we're looking at as well is the Human Rights Council meets three times a year. They never looked just at the United States before. So this urgent debate this summer was quite significant because you did see the marches take place even here in Honolulu, 10,000 people on a weekend. And I know, d -Rec, you were born here, so welcome home again. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing to see that 10,000 marched here in the middle of COVID, but in a safe way, as you talked about, and organized using those human rights, the right to freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, to then demand dignity and use these tools to transform the society. And we know when the High Commissioner for Human Rights presents her report tomorrow, it'll be a first step and we know that we should still push for a commission of inquiry looking into systemic racism and police brutality in the United States. The other angle though that was quite important is 
we were on a, a side event today in Geneva, and that was at the UN Human Rights Council because that is what will happen tomorrow. But then on November 9th, the Universal Periodic Review will take place, and the United States will be reviewed for three and a half hours. So for three and a half hours, all 193 member states can ask the US questions and make recommendations. Are there any recommendations that you would like to see countries make to the United States to change the daily conditions here? I think um, we have to acknowledge that police brutality is just one piece of a corrupt puzzle. Like it's, it's literally just one bolt removed from a racist apparatus known as the American criminal justice system. Um, our lives are bound to dismantling that system while creating new ones of, of equity in a way. So I think acknowledging um, that there's, that there's just progress that needs to be made, that Black people have been historically um, victimized by this country um, because of what we've gone through, and a, a request to reimagine policing. And I think that starts with um, reallocating a lot of the police funding. Um, I know in St. Louis, Missouri, w uh, Black men have the highest death rate out of uh, the top 50 major cities in terms of their interactions with police, but St. Louis police officers are one of the highest paid in the Midwest. So I think looking at um, how we structure policing, how we fund policing, as well as reallocating not only some of the funding, but reallocating some of the responsibilities. Being a police officer is hard. My sister was a, was a cop, but I also know um, that being a social worker is hard, that being a therapist is hard, that being a teacher is hard. And I think some of those duties and things that we're asking police officers to do should be reallocated to individuals who are more properly trained. So those would be my, my two requests to kind of deconstruct our, our current police system, reimagine it, and um, reallocate funding as well as uh, job duties as well. Thank you. And the, the good aspect is this universal periodic review it allows countries who are doing policing in different ways, many would say also better, also a human rights-based approach to actually make the suggestion showing what's worked in their country and why that could be applicable to America. Greg, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, I just, I think it's important that we recognize that America is going through two public health crises right now. Um, gun violence, again, over 100,000 people are shot or killed by guns every year. Um, and when we had similar numbers with COVID-19, the entire country shut down. But this type of crisis has been going on for decades and we haven't seen any major political policy or financial adjustments to address this. Um, and so the first big thing is we really need to bring home the urgency of this crisis and remind folks that because this is majority black or brown folks impacted, it does not mean it's an acceptable crisis um, for America to overlook. The second big thing is you know, I think uh, DREC talks a lot about policing and law enforcement and how we can allocate those funds to people better equipped. Um, I wanna just reinforce that because there are uh, community-based solutions that work, that will reduce violence, that will address crime, especially violent crime, more effectively than law enforcement, but puts the dollars in the hands of the community um, and invests in the people who are most at risk to help them lead a healthier lifestyle um, and not just let's just arrest them and put them away. No, why don't we get to people before something bad happens, invest in their life and their situation and help them have a healthier, more positive uh, pathway um, to their future. Um, and these programs exist, they're highly underfunded. Um, America puts over $3 billion federally into law enforcement. That does not include state level funding or local level funding. Um, but when you look at funding and community-based violence reduction programs, it's less than $100,000. Um, so that just shows you very clearly how we are trying to address this problem. Um, and the incarceral approach is simply not working. Um, but you'll hear politicians on both sides of the aisle and all over the country parade um, their law enforcement statistics, but never parade how these communities are starting to thrive. They'll never parade the lives saved the most the at risk youth who who now is an overperformer either in the school or in the workplace. Um, and there are programs that are committed to doing that, that are effective at doing that, and most importantly, cheaper 
um, <laughs> and cheaper and easier and then more uh, cost efficient um, in ways of, of reducing violence. Um, and so please don't let uh, folks continue this, this cycle of, of feeding to, to the world that law enforcement is the way to address violent crime. Because in reality, it is, the le it is not the most effective way to do it. And at this stage, it's the shame of our community. I think, yeah, law enforcement is the quickest way when communities are already struggling to, to keep them disenfranchised and disengaged. And to me, this system, like, again, to talk about how systems work, I believe the criminal justice system is working exactly how it's supposed to, which is to keep a minority group disengaged and uninformed about exactly what's going on across this country. And for me, this gun violence is a public health crisis, but it's not being addressed because of who the victims are. Black Americans are disproportionately impacted by gun violence. They experience nearly 10 times the gun homicides, 15 times the gun assaults, and three times the fatal police shootings of white Americans. And I believe if it was white children dying at those rates, this address, this would be, this crisis would be addressed um, ex ex very, very quickly, very quickly. And can I just add one thing? It, okay. is, it is the number one cause of death for Black youth. Think about that. If there was anything preventable that was the number one cause of any type, any demographic of youth, we would be jumping through every hoop possible to address it. Um, and it's been like that for decades. And so I, I definitely want to thank DREC for just highlighting those different statistics. But this is not, this is not, you know, some crazy, you know, crime television show. No, these are our kids, our children, our future that are dying by something that's preventable. And we have failed as a country to address it. Um, and so if there's anything that you can bring home, it's just pushing forward the urgency of addressing this public health crisis with public health solutions and not more law enforcement. Thank you so much. And I think what you're talking about really does address the situation. Those statistics are stunning, 100,000, but more powerful are your stories and speaking truth to power. I'd like to thank you both for joining us on Cooper Union. Uh, this is the whole world is watching and human rights in the United States episode. And we thank all of our viewers. And we definitely hope this isn't the last time that we can meet and discuss. Maybe we can have a follow up after the UPR. And more importantly, maybe after legislation is adopted that improves the situation in the country. And I know we will be part of that solution with the organizing that both of you are doing. And thank you for dedicating your lives to human rights. Thank you. Thanks, thank John. you. Mahalo. Maluhia Mekapono. Thank you again for tuning in to Cooper Union.